Hi everyone, how are you? Welcome to our book club today here at EBCO. We are really excited to have you. Today's book, as you know, is Girls Stop Apologizing by Rachel Hollis. Uh, we're curious, we'll get started here in a second by asking who had heard of her, who hadn't, who thought this was brand new. And we're going to be digging in today about the whole trend around self-empowerment, self-improvement, and what it means for companies and brands and all of the innovation and marketing professionals that we have joining us today. So like I said, we're really excited to have you. We're going to jump right in. We would love for this to be collaborative as always. So if you want to add something to the chat box, please do. Please say hello. Please ask questions and have some contribution. And we're really excited to see where this takes us. Awesome. And before we dive in, we actually went to Rachel Hollis's conference. So it's called the Rise Conference, if you haven't heard of it yet. And it's actually part of her larger brand presence that she has. So it's a three-day conference that takes time at different parts of the year. Actually, last year, she was so popular that the conference sold out, I think, in under an hour, um, like massive stadiums. So this year, she was a little more prepared. She has a larger team. I think her team went from seven people to 60 in a year, which is insane for all of us that know about team building and um, how much revenue that would require to sustain a team at that level. And so we actually got to go to her January conference. It was held in Fort Myers and it was really great because we actually got to see a lot of these trends come to life. We got to interact with consumers that are interested in her message. And we also got to see just how she's really built this big brand presence. So actually, Erin, why don't you tell us a little more about like what we actually saw as part of her brand image and also some of the things we got, we got when we were there. Yeah, definitely. So when we walked in, I mean, just from a branding perspective, it was unbelievable. She had so many people working in terms of where you need to go, how you got your badge, how you got your swag. There was signage everywhere. There was things perfectly ready for social. So there were stickers on the ground to lead to Instagram pop-ups and gorgeous backgrounds where you could talk about living your best life and today's going to be a great day and take selfies in front of those sorts of mm -hmm. things. It was just so well put together down to every single bit of effort uh, as soon as you came in the music the the coordination between mm -hmm. the dj and the things that she was saying it was just so much more i would say than just um your typical conference and just a lot to learn from a branding perspective and then of course we learned some things that mm -hmm. we've incorporated here at the office yeah so some of the things that we thought were pretty cool is one for her event she gives out this really great notebook that's actually uh, the way it's organized is based on the flow that you go through the conference so the first day is all about your past and then so the past section actually takes you through exercises that are designed for you to dive deeper into you know some of the challenges or experiences you may have had in your past life present is all about health and wellness so she has a whole day dedicated to that and then the third day is dedicated to your future. So vision casting, setting goals, thinking about what you want to manifest. And this is kind of a fun example of a roadmap here. I thought that was really cool to give consumers tools that can ultimately help them think about how to organize some of their goal setting practices. And I think what's also interesting is we've really seen the planner industry blow up lately. Um, if you are, if you've been to Target recently, you may have seen that they have like entire aisles now dedicated to planners and journals and goal setting and we'll be talking about what this trend really ladders into when we think of younger generations especially and how this trend around sort of living your best life and goal setting and being intentional and being mindful how that's really a new movement that we're seeing as part of this and her planner came in there so actually we're gonna give one of these away at the end but yeah this is really fun so this is a start today journal and mm -hmm. she actually did this because um she would show a blank piece of paper on her instagram every day showing how she writes out her own goals and so people would ask her like you know we really want a version of that that you make for us and then we can buy it and so she actually created it based on the practice that she does <laughs> made from more hat everyone yeah, got a hat that's a hat that she gave us inside of the swag bags mm -hmm. um Awesome. So we're going to jump right in now to the presentation that we have here today. And again, if there's any questions that you have as we're going or um, any dialogue you want to start, um, please feel free to do that in the chat box. Absolutely. So just real quick, if you're new to our book club, I see a ton of repeat people, which we love, and our book club is just growing. I don't know that it's growing as fast as Rachel Hollis is following, but <laughs> still, we're real excited to have you here today. We are an Austin-based trend and insight firm. We are a go-to resource for Fortune 1000 companies, and we do custom engagements looking at the future of the industry to reveal new products, new technologies, new business models, growth opportunities, and as some of you know, we work across all categories, and we're always tapping into trends that are 
impacting all of our clients' categories. And that's why you see us presenting something today that is quite ubiquitous in impacting consumers across the board. So real quick, stay tuned until the end. We have giveaways. That's always my favorite part. Um, we have some journals and some other Hollis swag. So definitely stay on till the end. And then just to jump us off real quick, have you heard of Rachel Hollis before reading this book? If you could answer that poll real quick, I'd love to see how many of you are new to this topic, how many of you had already heard of her. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting. Some of the emails I got from different people in the club were saying that they had, they were surprised they never heard of her because once they read the book, they saw it at every airport they went to. Um, they found out their wife or their partner or somebody they knew was interested in Rachel Hollis. So it's one of those things, once you know, you tend to see it everywhere because she does have right now two bestsellers on the New York Times list. And she also is probably in terms of when you think of famous thought leaders, she's pretty high up there now in terms of being able to sell out stadiums and she has a QVC line. So this is definitely not some small niche thing. It really represents what a broader spectrum of consumers is interested in. And what's so great is this poll, it says it's about even. So it looks like about half of you had heard of Rachel Hollis and half of you hadn't. So um, pretty interesting. Um, I would say pretty still high awareness rate. So why this book? One of the reasons, and we actually debated whether we should pick this book or not, because it does fall into that self-help category and that self-development category, which we are not mindset and motivation experts or coaches. There's a whole industry of people that decide to specialize in that. Um, but the reason we wanted to pick this is because um, from a personal interest, I actually read both of Rachel's books last year. And, you know, at first I wasn't sure if I liked it or not. I was like, to be honest, I, the tone and just the way is kind of very, um, uh, very kind of take charge, very, um, I think she definitely has a certain personality or persona associated with her. Um, and then I realized I started seeing it everywhere and I realized it really laddered into this trend around motivation and mindset. And one of the things that we saw at her conference was that there were so many different consumer types there. So we saw high schoolers, you know, she actually called on to talk about some of the challenges that they face. And I'll tell you what's interesting is high schoolers deal with the same things that we deal with as adults. So it's pretty interesting just to see that, that um, kind of universal truth in terms of human. And then we also saw like 60 year olds, 70 year olds. I mean, we really saw a full spectrum of people there. We saw people from all walks of life. We saw people who... Um, stay-at-home parents. We saw executives. We saw people who were in career transition. Uh, we saw people who had all different types of interests. And the reason we know this is part of what she did there was uh, went through an exercise of asking people what things that they had experienced. And you would look around and realize how many people shared these experiences. And just from a, a consumer perspective, it's really impressive that demographically, she really covers the board. So what does that mean to us when we start thinking of brands and thinking about how we communicate with consumers? Is there a more universal truth? And we'll get actually into that a little bit, even when it comes to Maslow and some of those deeper concepts, uh, more universal truths when we start to think about segmentation and how we speak to them. Yeah, and, and Greg asked, what was the demographic split? I would say it was pretty, it was pretty across the board. Yeah, I would say, I mean, if I had to guess, it would be older millennials, younger Gen, Gen X. In yeah, that, probably that 35 to 50 year old range. And there was, there was a few definitely centennials there, but I think the price and the cost of going to a conference like that probably prohibits like a large group of high school students and young college students from attending. Um, she's even mentioned that, that most people buy her book and they sort of upgrade to her conference or buy other products from her. She also has a life coaching and business coaching program that's done monthly. Um, her husband now has a book coming out. So her company is just, you know, it's kind of exploded and they really say she's like the female Tony Robbins, if that gives you a good analog for someone that is resonating more with this generation where um, sort of the old school mindset development was really around um, sort of like don't fall into victim mentality. And now we're seeing this new school, which is a little bit softer, a little more inclusive, but also about really taking charge and ownership over your life, which is kind of a huge theme we see in terms of consumer sentiment right now. So some of the themes that we're gonna to cover today, um, we're gonna to look at fixed versus growth mindset, which is a huge tenet of the self-care or self-motivation industry and self-help industry, I should say. Um, we'll talk about how that filters into brands perspective. And it might even, you know, there might be some personal implication here as well as um, team implication, but I think it's a really wide concept that we see that's trending right now. Um, we, we'll talk about growth mindset and pop culture. We'll talk about key themes that we're seeing from the book. Um, we're going to talk about growth mindset in the market. Um, and then we'll end with the goal action plan that she describes and talk about some product opportunities. And then we'll do a giveaway. 
Yeah, and just real quick to address one of the questions. Someone has said, given the demographic there, do we know if younger people are resonating with this? And I love that question because actually we addressed this. We had a, a webinar on Gen Z. And we talked so much about their interest in self-awareness, self-empowerment, and really turning inwards to find out what they're all about because they are so inundated in who they are supposed to be. They're inundated in content. There is so much chatter out there that this generation is really taking a turn more towards authenticity and figuring out who they are. So absolutely, younger people are definitely resonating with this message. But given the cost of like what Kaylin said, traveling there and, and sorting yourself out for a conference, we haven't seen that exact model take hold for them attend the Gen Z webinar. You know what, let us get back to that. That one is past, but if there's enough interest, we can uh, make that happen again and, and send it out. Thank you for that. So now we're gonna dive into our first pillar that we're gonna talk about, which is really fixed versus growth mindset. We've really seen this shift collectively in education and culture and also corporate America that celebrates this constant evolution of learning new skills and continuously improving. Um, so it's not about seeing what you're not good at, but instead seeking to really expand those existing and new talents. Um, so we've seen this sort of in the education space now where there's a lot of new skill sets required for how the economy is changing. When we think of going into this high tech, high expertise economy that schools have had re relatively a hard time keeping up with. And so we've seen individuals start to chart their own path, think about what's really gonna educate and inspire them, and also look at very non-traditional career paths. Um, they say now that a study was done that Gen Z consumers say that they wanna grow up and be a YouTube star. Can we all think about how different that is from our childhood where maybe we were told to be lawyers or doctors or go into something very traditional? So the basis that we're seeing is that this generation really thinks of themselves as creators and when you think of yourself as a creator and really empower yourself you're thinking about it very differently in terms of what skills you need to acquire what you need to learn it's just very not fixed in terms of your mindset and how you normally go about things so real quick who invented the popular and popularized the fixed mindset and growth mindset we'll see how many of you are familiar with the author who came up with this Back in, fun fact, 1996. All right, the answers are coming in. Looks like we're a little across the board, so let us tell you. So most of you thought it was Dr. Hirsch, but it was in fact, 2006, excuse me, it was in fact Dr. Carol Dweck. Yeah, so this definitely has its roots in science and psychology, and so I think that's what's so interesting about this movement is that it's, where it's coming out in pop culture, but it does have roots in something that has actually been studied and something that they found to be true when they looked at humans and psychology. Um, so in terms of fixed mindset, and you'll see how this theme really is correlated strongly with the book, but fixed mindset is thinking you're either good at it or you're not. Um, so not thinking that there's any middle ground to improve or any gray space there. If I fail, I'm no good. So thinking of, uh, we can think of this in innovation, right? Where we're sort of taught to fail forward, to look at failure as a learning opportunity. And that's something that usually we have to teach ourselves to do. It's not always inherently natural to be like, I'm gonna fail and it's gonna be okay. That's something that we sort of have to almost brainwash ourselves to get into that mindset and also feel that that's just part of the process of life, that it's more of a journey to get to that winning product or that winning idea. I don't like to be challenged. Um, so this is a pretty interesting, if you read the book, a lot of it was around Rachel challenging herself, whether it's you know running marathons or um, talking about why you should be okay with challenging yourself and it's okay to not be good at something. It's okay for something to be really hard because ultimately the reward at the end of it is going to be much more worth it. And I think we can see that resonated when we think of things like Tough Mudder or kind of all these extreme challenges now that consumers are taking on because they know that that delayed gratification is ultimately that experience that they're looking for. Um, and we'll talk about how that really feeds into this self-actualization mindset. Um, also feeling like feedback is personal and is usually comes from a face of fixed mindset. Um, versus kind of isolating that from yourself. If you succeed, I feel threatened. Um, one of the things that I really like that we've seen with a lot of brands now is focusing on really celebrating others, whether it's women, it's being more inclusive. It's not, it's kind of having this tribe or this group mentality. Um, so we've seen that with brands, even like Third Love Bras, where they talk about celebrating your body the way it is. Um, if you are familiar with that brand, you actually do a quiz where they ask you about your body type and they have just so many different options and really the brand just feels like it's empowering you to really be who you are. Um, and so it's less about like comparing yourself to others or um, not feeling good about yourself. And that's kind of a, a positive brand attribute that we've seen with a lot of 
new brands that are coming out, with, especially the direct to consumer and e-commerce models. And also, if I if I give up, if I find something difficult. Um, so we'll be talking about how we're seeing that really infiltrate all the cate- the categories. So for years, educators, coaches, and employers believe that a person's talents and capacity for achievement were fixed. Who you are today is exactly who you'll be tomorrow. But when Dr. Dweck introduced this more nuanced, nuanced idea, we learned about growth mindset, that people can be flexible, adapt, and grow in their talents. And what we love about this is I'm sure you on the call right now can see the parallels with innovation. I mean, the whole idea of building an innovation department is a team that is flexible, that can adapt to change, that is comfortable trying out new capabilities, new vendors, new methodologies. And so that's where we've really started to love this parallel between people thinking about fixed versus growth mindset and then fixed versus growth mindset inside the workplace. Mm -hmm. The innovation teams and the market research teams that we work with really deploying this as a function of their abilities as a team. Yeah, so we had another question. So someone asked that, you know, they noticed that Rachel is definitely targeting um, her tribe as females who might be struggling to find themselves or take action in their life with the addition of her husband. So if you're familiar with her brand, um, especially in her book, she talks about her husband a lot. He runs the operational side of the business. How do you see them adapting the male perspective into the business? I think this is a great question. And I think that, um, you know, she purposely targeted um, women, I think in her positioning, it was much tighter. I think it's much more provocative. Um, and from a branding perspective, and I didn't actually see any men at the rise conference. Well, there was a couple, there was a couple in the audience. Yeah. But really, uh, what I think, I believe the answer to this is, is that there are, there are counterparts to Rachel Hollis out there. There's Brendan Bouchard, there's Tony Robbins, there's other powerhouses that are talking about similar things that have either a more broad demographic audience in terms of men and women, but also skew more masculine in terms of some of the ways that they teach it and more of the way that they connect. Rachel's really taken the space for women, but it is accessible uh, for men to live in this zone of, of empowerment yeah. and self-improvement as well. Yeah. And also um, I, her husband, Dave Hollis, is coming out with a book. I believe it's out this month or next month. And it's about getting out of your own way. And he really talks about his journey where he actually identifies with coming from a fixed mindset where he used to think that if he had to work on himself, it meant that there was something broken or inherently wrong with him. And so he's pretty open about that journey where Rachel and kind of her philosophy of being more growth minded helped him identify that just because I'm working on something doesn't mean that inherently I'm bad or I'm wrong. It just means that I'm going to keep becoming the best version of myself every day. Um, so he's talking about that process. I think you'll find he's, he's a lot more structured, I think, in his thinking. Um, so he definitely comes from a different philosophy. So if you're a fan of the brand, the brand that'll definitely be coming out soon. And you can sort of see how they're bringing the male perspective um, in. But I think to Aaron's point, this trend really goes beyond, I think, just a female audience. It's, um, I mean, for a while, the self help industry was highly dominated by males. When you think of Tony Robbins and other thought leaders that have been in this industry for decades. Yeah. And so perfect segue there to growth mindset, which is all about being able to learn anything, learning from your your failures, challenging yourself, understanding that feedback can be constructive, being inspired by others. Again, to reiterate, we see a lot of these things in the work environment as well, especially on innovation teams. Any team that wants to grow, do something that's impressive and really shakes up the industry is going to be utilizing these standards. So when we think about traditional goal setting, um, and I think this really aligns from a cultural perspective as well, is that traditional goal setting is a decision to set goals was made from dissatisfaction from current performance or situation. Goals are usually set intentionally to fix aspects of a person's attitude, behavior. Uh, Working on goals is very linear. So there's sort of a a goal set, a plan set, and you work towards the plan. It's, It's pretty straightforward. Um, And this kind of might be all the way that we've all learned to set goals in the past, which is just very traditional and having a plan and measuring it. We're seeing the evolution in terms of how consumers think about goal setting and pursuing their dreams and things that they want to go after is that a decision to set goals is made based on what excites and motivates us, focusing on your passion. And this is really prevalent. We talked about this on another, another webinar we did, but the Enneagram. So the Enneagram is all around what motivates you. So if you're um, a type three, you know, a lot of your motivation is around, um, is around um, usually being noticed for what you do, being yeah, achievements, achievements um, having others um, being able to speak about what you like doing and having others notice that um, where a type one is typically more, 
motivated by sort of having a logical order to their life, sort of knowing what's right and wrong. Um, so what we're seeing is just sort of this evolution around really knowing yourself and having that self-awareness and then setting goals based on what Pat, what's going to excite you and motivate you. And so a goal could be very non-traditional. It could be that you're going to make time for yourself every day, that you're going to wake up two hours earlier than your kids, that you're going to introduce a ritual where you don't drink coffee anymore, but maybe you have a mud chai tea. So it's pretty non-linear and very non-traditional now. And we're seeing a lot of brands capitalize on that. I mean, I see so many, my feeds are inundated with startup brands that really talk about you know, having some type of ritual in your day, doing something for yourself. Um, and I think this is really based on just kind of this self-optimization attitude we're seeing across segments right now. So why is this topic so interesting? So originally applied as a theory to understand school-age children's attitudes on failure. Um, what Carol did, her and her team determined that when students believe they can get smarter, they understand that effort makes them stronger. Um, so sort of equating effort with something that's actually making you um, going to be better at the end of the day. You're going to be stronger. You're going to be more resilient. You're going to have more perseverance. As adults, many of us find ourselves in a professional or personal situation where we feel stuck and unable to move forward. The adoption of the growth mindset, which we've seen celebrities talk about, we've seen social influencers talk about, just demonstrates this growing prioritization of personal agency that we all have personal agency over our decisions. And that's actually something that Rachel talked about in her book was that we all have control over our schedule, but a lot of you know, kind of the analog for her was that a lot of people act like their schedule controls them. And she's like, no, you know, everyone has personal agency. And so she really talks about that a lot about restructuring your calendar to really reflect what motivates you in life and what you're personally passionate about. And so that's why um, to us, some of us, it might be pretty extreme, but I think she said she wakes up at four or 5 a.m. to work out, to write her book. And that's really what's made her successful is, is giving herself that time each day. So we also see growth mindset in pop culture. So growth mindset has really moved beyond academics. So it's um, while there are academic studies um, and psychological studies, we're seeing it that it's manifesting in all aspects of consumers' life. So whether it's personal, uh, mental, and spiritual, which I really love, um, we've seen a whole um, new wave of companies, um, experts, and influencers that talk about mental and spiritualness. Part of this, I think, is we've talked about this before as well, is around just the decline in religion and what does that get replaced with. We see more consumers looking for self-awareness and also the spiritual connection to whether it's the universe or energy or each other. They're really looking that to help build their, their emotional set point. And so we see that this practice of goal making, continuous learning, and positivity um, is really kind of an ethos of younger generations specifically. Um, I even saw, so on the Friar Fest documentary, if you watch that on Netflix or Hulu, they asked, um, there was one point of that documentary where they asked, um, I think it was the Centennial Influencer, so some of the younger YouTube stars that are going to go there and film about their experience, they asked them about their personal brand and they said, we're all about positivity, you know, positivity is my brand, I'm just positive about everything. And I thought that was really interesting, just how we're seeing younger generations really kind of adopt this philosophy that they're going to be personally responsible for their energy and their decisions. Um, and they're going to adopt this positivity first sentiment. And I think that really goes in nicely with growth mindset and sort of taking ownership and awareness of um, how your energy impacts others, how it impacts you, how the decisions you make are ultimately um, going to help advance you into what you want to do with your life. So why is this topic so interesting to EBCO? I know that we've talked about this a couple of times so far, but the way we relate to connect and connect to consumers is evolving because it's no longer about helping consumers be themselves, it's about empowering them to become the best versions of themselves. And this is really exciting. After this next section here, we're gonna go into what do brands look like that are growth mindset versus fixed mindset? And that'll really speak to their ones that are operating in a way that really help people to feel empowered and become the best versions of themselves rather than saying, you need me to be the best. So as you mentioned, we wanted to talk about how this is coming up in pop culture. So we see growth mindset is sort of addictive um, because it's based on the premise that regular people can be great. So a person no longer has to have an Ivy League education or a very traditional background to be successful or come up with a big idea. There's actually been a lot of democratization of things like entrepreneurship. Um, learning is democratized because especially Rachel, one of her famous things that she says is that um, I'm a girl with a Google search bar. Like essentially I've looked up everything that I've ever done on my laptop, how to publish a book, how to have my own conference, how to start my own company. All of it has been um, through Google. And so that's idea, this notion that 
it's really up to you how far you're going to go. Um, that's a pretty common sentiment we're seeing with consumers. Um, and previously, I think there was sort of um, this elitism around this knowledge of what it would take to maybe launch an idea or um, maybe have this information of how you're going to have this expertise in order to structure your life the way that you want it to. And now it's available to anyone that's willing to essentially work hard enough. Um, definitely hustle and and grinding are kind of common terms you usually hear associated with this, that it's gonna be up to you how far you wanna grow, um, but that also gives people that personal agency and that personal ownership over their own path. Um, and one of the things, especially in the US, is that we talk a lot about losing our middle class, um, is that consumers are looking for these new paths to prosperity. Such a younger generation, they see themselves as usually working for themselves, as starting their own thing as maybe being a content creator or an influencer um, and they're really looking for you know personal agency is one of those things that really resonates with them so we also are from a macro perspective we're having a transition to a knowledge economy across a lot of different countries where our economy is really in a process of transforming where knowledge is replacing labor and manufacturing and the value of goods and services from a company is based on intangible and tangible assets um, so I think we've seen this in CPG where a lot of products now have a service element to them, whether it's some type of expertise, whether it's through AI or it's through maybe the network of consumers that use it or experts. Um, but this idea that, you know, we're starting to think about what we can replace with material assets and have it more based on knowledge and education. And I think that also really mirrors with how the workforce is going to have to adapt in this new age in order to be successful. We also see a demand for personal coaching. So I was pretty floored, I think several years ago when I saw the statistic that life coaching was the second fastest growing career behind IT services. And so it's one of those industries that has like, for people who aren't immersed in life coaching or the self-help industry, it can sort of be shocking that this is such a, a high growing industry. And I think there's a couple reasons to that. One is that, you know, there's not like certain credentials you have to do to be a life coach. So a lot of consumers can sort of enter the space um, and essentially just sign up and become their own life coach, get clients. Uh, but I think it's also just interesting to think about how many consumers are interested in this industry. And it really goes back to this larger trend we've been talking about around empowerment and motivation and charting your own course, making your own path. And so we expect that, researchers expect that this industry is gonna continue to grow, is expected to reach 1.34 billion by 2022. So we're still seeing um, this theme really resonate with consumers and this empowerment angle and um, this knowledge economy continue to grow. <clears throat> we also see this when we look at, you know, established startups and brands that are really capitalizing on this trend. So if you've heard of Talkspace, this is therapy on demand. Um, so you might've seen the Michael Phelps ad. <laughs> He's a pretty famous spokesperson for the brand. And this is um, where you're able to actually interact with a therapist on text, on demand, um, and really goes to that trend around being able to access an expert. Calm is another one where um, if you've seen um, some of their case studies, it's just phenomenal what they've been able to do in terms of turning and generating revenue around pro subscriptions for meditation. Um, they have a lot of brand presence and awareness now. And it's all around kind of accessing this expertise, which they've developed into meditations. And they're kind of a great example of the knowledge economy and something that you can purchase. And it's not a physical product, but it is that service and that subscription product. Shine is one that we, I thought was pretty interesting in doing research for this. Um, they're around self-care and life coaching. So part of it is just giving you that wave of positivity every day, um, helping you take care of your mental health. That is a kind of a trend in itself around mental health and people just being much more open about their, the state of their mental health and what they're doing to ultimately nourish themselves each day. Um, so just like you would work out or potentially eat healthier food, also thinking about your brain and how you're feeling and ma managing that and mitigating it before you get to a point where um, you know, you're having a scenario where it's harder to work yourself back from it. And then the last one is sleep better. So this is actually sleep coaching on demand where you would get a coach who would help walk you through what a sleep study might look like or what it might look like to change your sleeping habits for the better. So you can see all of these are really rooted in this expertise and this coaching industry. So coaching doesn't have to be like just life coaching. It can be sort of any expertise. How does that turn into a business model? How does that turn into something that consumers are willing to pay for? We're also seeing that this is sort of the era of the self-taught expert. Um, so according to a recent survey, 64 64% of employers agree that the need for continuous lifelong learning 
will demand higher levels of education and more credentials. Rather than sweeping away degrees, we're seeing new types of online credentials. So different types of certificates, whether it's micro masters, badges. Um, I've seen a lot that are, are sort of accreditations that are come from a certain industry like life coaching or sleeping as an example. Um, they're sort of self-made by those associations and those industries. And they become these like building blocks um, for these more affordable kind of self-taught degree programs. And so we expect this trying to continue where sort of people have their own path that they're following um, and they have a very maybe non-traditional traditional career that's maybe built on some of these building blocks that they've been able to get from these tribes of like-minded people. And I think you definitely saw that theme kind of resonated in Rachel's book where she talks about sort of charting your own roadmap and figuring out how you're going to get those skills, how you're going to acquire those. And that's definitely a sentiment that's really strong um, with generations that are still in that life stage of figuring out what they're going to do with their life and figuring out what they're passionate about. And so I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, why is this happening now? Where is this drive coming from? And a lot of that has to do with self-actualization at the top of Maslow's hierarchy, which we see here, taking on a new position as people reconsider materialism and all of the things that they're purchasing. People are really th thinking a lot about sustainability right now and their impact on the environment and the brands and the products that they interact with. They're thinking about career aspirations as technology has displaced a lot of uh, occupations and there's new perspectives on what schooling is necessary to enter the job market. We also have access to information and technology that we never had before. So with all of these new things circulating in people's minds and the things that they're considering, a lot of the lower levels of Maslow's hierarchy, this is one theory that's out there that we can understand from what we're seeing as well, that a lot of these things are taken care of in new and unique ways. And now we're able to think about love and belonging, esteem, and actually self-actualization, being the most that we can through empowerment and self-learning, which is just a really interesting perspective when you start to think about this through the lens of the segments and the people that you're, you're uh, catering to. Yeah, another kind of theme that we're seeing within this larger trend is really questioning materialism. Um, so we've seen throughout, I think this ladders nicely into sustainability, um, but people are looking for this knowledge economy and this service economy because we're kind of at a stage of questioning what the future of materials might be. Um, there's been the downfall of Forever 21, which if you've been following them, they did really well um, with older millennials. I mean, when um, I remember back to my college days and pretty much every weekend I would go get a bag of Forever 21 products like to wear out for the weekend. Um, and now it's sort of a stigma. Like if you go to Forever 21, it, it just kind of, it's not a good brand presence, especially for Centennials. And what they're finding is that instead Centennials are visiting retailers like Goodwill, um, resale shops, finding out how to make garments their own. It sort of goes back to that theme around self-expression and your values. Um, we're also seeing brands like Kuana, which they focus on basically having fewer items that are better quality. Um, so looking for things that really align with your tastes and your interests. Um, and only purchasing one of them versus like needing to kind of have this gratification of having a whole bag of new products and that ultimately will last longer. And then we also saw at um, Nordstrom recently announced that they're going to start doing a resale shop. This is such a cool movement that they're starting, but because they have such a good generous return policy where they return a lot of um, items that are either slightly used or um, somebody doesn't want anymore without a receipt, they're going to now start reselling those items in um, some of their stores. They're going to actually merchandise them, give them a lot of attention, and then resell them so they don't have to damage those items out and contribute to waste. So overall, we're seeing that, you know, we're seeing signs in the economy that brands and consumers are questioning this need to have this material gratification. And so if we're always on the hunt for what's new, how we can improve, it makes sense that we're going to start focusing on things that help us get to that level of self-actualization, whether it's a fitness goal, a mental goal, a wellness goal, versus just feeling like we can sort of um, compensate for that by going shopping and kind of getting that quick fix or that quick hit. So when we study consumers, we think about this lens, and we touched on this in the Gen Z as well as the Enneagram webinars that we've done in the past, but today's consumers, they don't view themselves as a life stage. So thinking of a college student or I'm part of a growing family, they don't think of themselves as a consumer specifically of media, like talk about how much technology I'm using, how much content I'm viewing, and they don't think of themselves as a product of a certain household income. It's very, very fluid now in their thinking. They're much more likely to think about 
I'm driven by my unique passion. I'm always evolving. I'm growing. I'm learning. I might like something different or become something different in the future. And they think about themselves as a thought leader. They have ideas. They have their own perspective. And when we start to think of consumers this way, our perspective as a brand can change and evolve as well. So you're probably thinking right now, you know, this concept seems intangible. What does it mean for the goods and service that all of us work on every day? How does this perspective shape how consumers are shopping our category and how can we activate growth mindset? And so we're going to dig into that right now. So as a thought starter, what differentiates brands with a growth mindset from the rest? So I'll give you a second just to think about that. If you have any thoughts that you want to add to the chat, please go ahead. And then I'm going to dig in here. Um, specifically about what differentiates brands with growth mindset from the rest. The first one being they always go first. So these are brands that leverage the latest trends. They'll understand what are the latest uh, tools they can use on social media. Like when TikTok came out real big, these are brands with a growth mindset. They're ready to try what's new. It might be an uncertain space. They might be uncertain of what demographics or segments will relate to what they're trying. They don't necessarily know the outcome of what they're trying, but they are ready to go first. Yeah, an example of this related to the book that we're having is, so at the conference we went to, Rachel mentioned that she's on TikTok now, even though it's something that her kids like, that you know personally she doesn't really um, I think she mentioned like she had to learn how to do it. She didn't like personally run to like go off of Instagram, but she did it because she felt that high school students and centennials really needed to hear some of the content that she has. So she's having that growth mindset that trying something new, going after a segment she would normally not be associated with was something that she was going to have like this kind of learning lesson and actually go experiment and try things and see if that segment is resonating with her content. Yeah. This is the idea of jumping on the bandwagon, doing something that, pulls us away from that mantra of, well, we've never done it before, or we don't have that expertise in house. This is rather, you know what, let's give it a try and see what happens. And that leads us into um, the next one here. So focusing on the process, growth mindset brands enjoy the process of building connections, of developing their brand over time, of seeing about how they're going to expand into the market and grow into new avenues, grow with new segments. It's not about specifically winning a race. Because if you think about it, winning a race is the same as accomplishing something in a very fixed manner. But in a growth mindset, it's all about that drive, that enthusiasm, that passion of the team and of getting out there into the world and showing what our brand is all about. So really focusing on the process and embracing it as part of who we are versus just, okay, we need to launch this, we need to get it to market, and we need to see what the ROI is, how many units we move. So really thinking about that process part of it is very important. So the third one here is anticipating. So they anticipate what's next. These brands, these companies are very proactive. They deep dive into industry trends. They're not afraid of new trends that are coming around the corner that are going to change and shift their industry that might have a negative impact on the way the industry has always been has been run or has been developing over time. These are disruptive technologies that are coming out and they say, you know what, we're part of understanding these trends. We're going to align our strategy with a future facing approach and they're going to identify future facing opportunities by anticipating what's next, which yes. is very different than some of those traditional methodologies where we see where is a white space opportunity or where is a pain point that we can fill or how can we evolve our product with a new feature or a, some new functionality, but rather think more holistically about what's next and do something and embrace something that may be disruptive. It looks like we have another interesting comment. So someone mentioned that on a parallel line, this speaks to the questioning of and shift from the traditional education model to more of a targeted skills aligned basis of learning. And how disruptive do you think this evolution will be to universities and colleges globally, adoption or ext extinction? I think it's a really interesting question. I think there's like a few contenders there. I mean, we definitely have um, in the U.S. colleges that focus on more skill-based learning or creative education models where you're learning something in applied format, we're going to go get a specific job. So a lot of times those colleges are highly adaptable. They develop new education programs based on the types of roles that they're seeing in that industry because they're usually highly connected to what that industry needs. So an example of that would be like a music school or um, a production school changing to maybe have classes around shorter production formats or micro content formats. Um, so I definitely think we are seeing some universities at least go much faster in how they adapt and evolve that content. Um, I, but I think you're right that there's going to be some disruption in terms of 
that this generation has access to start their careers early. I mean, Erin actually has somebody in her household that's pretty much trying to start her career, I think, at 11. Yes, yes. I have an entrepreneur in my household who's ready to go, and she has she has all the information she needs at her fingertips to actually know how a business runs. Now, you know, getting investment and <laughs> support of all of those around her is a whole other thing. But in terms of the knowledge that she has, she's light years away from anyone who was doing this 20 years ago. Yeah. And I think since I've, um, you know, since I've known kind of about some of um, the things that Mia has been doing, it seems like cotton candy business and like, I'm kind of on a peripheral edge, but it definitely seems more sophisticated than when we went to school and just so many resources, like, creating it, becoming an influencer on TikTok. Like there's all these different paths now that start someone's education path and their uh, earning path a lot sooner. So I think that definitely impacts where they ultimately go to school. Um, but then obviously there's still at an individual level, like how motivated someone is or maybe how inspired they are to pursue that. But I think from a trends, we're definitely seeing that continue to grow. So number four here, they test their limits constantly. We really love this one, but to maintain leadership position in an industry, Growth mindset brands challenge their boundaries and their thinking continuously to achieve breakthrough results. So this is idea that you don't really know where the limits are until you reach them and go beyond them. And so to always stay in a safe zone is really, uh, I would say, detrimental to the innovation process or the leadership process out in your industry because you'll never be the one to be ahead if you're a fast follower or you're just trying to keep up with the competition. And this is really where number three comes in. But understanding what's next, applying that, and testing the limits of what your right. capabilities are. And in terms of testing limits, um, I'm sure we've all seen the news article or maybe um, you're hearing about it for the first time now, but Panera just launched that they're going to do a new yep. subscription for free coffee and um, it's nine dollars a month right yeah yeah nine dollars so a unlimited month unlimited once you coffee. Pay. <laughs> yeah. free once you pay right but think um, about that i'm testing that out that could be a total failure it could be a money suck who knows what it is but they're obviously inspired by this new this business model the subscription business model that has evolved drastically and become very pervasive in our in our world yeah. in the last few years and from doing business model research i can tell you that there are definitely companies who are like well subscription great but like i don't i don't think that means anything to us because we're a retail business um we are not gonna you know we have food and beverage products we're not going to do anything in subscription uh but if you think about how they applied a new concept to their area and kept an open mind and thought about is that going to drive enough incremental revenue with food and beverage purchases? And that's what they're hoping on the back end. Uh, but pretty interesting just in terms of testing the limits of that industry and doing something very disruptive in order to gain new segments that I think they're already seeing that they're gaining new segments they previously did not have. All right. So number five is another really good one. And this is where you're going to have to partner up with your marketing PR teams, but they make fun of their own mistakes. They own them. So with an appetite for challenges come mistakes. Anytime you use a growth mindset, remember we talked about this in the beginning, I, I might fail, but I learned from it. Failures are inevitable. And this is the same when you implement an agile or a flexible or an in-house incubator model in, in an innovation team. You have higher risk, potentially higher ROI, but higher risk to the investment. And that's why we see a lot of teams uh, forming themselves in isolation from what the main teams to keep the business going are so that they can take on higher risks. They can own these mistakes. They can learn from them, see where the appetite is in the market. Yeah, and someone asked um, some examples of large fortune CPG companies. Um, I can definitely speak just a few top of mind. So I can tell you in terms of like some leaders that we see, definitely um, I think Amazon's philosophy is to basically be a trendsetter in their category and not just reacting to what the rest of the market is doing. Um, so you definitely see some leadership perspective of going first, being okay that something might fail, that um, it might not be a great idea. And I think that goes back to his story about starting his business and people told him that the, that would never work. Um, in terms of CPG brands, um, we definitely see more brands investing in categories that they've never previously been in historically. So going into new aisles, going into new areas, um, having teams that are specifically tasked for looking for those next big growth opportunities because they've felt, you know, one, they've probably seen it in the market around them that um, disruption is more rampant. There's startups doing things that we said we could never do. And then there's also kind of this, um, this new age retailing we're seeing where when you think of a retailer like Target, they just have new categories that didn't exist before. So when you think of things like beauty consumables um, or um, even sweat management products, but just things that create, you know, you'd have to really stay on top of new categories that are coming into the picture. All right. And then the last one here is they work super hard to get there. 
So the, they work super hard to get there. Behind every growth-driven brand is a powerhouse team. And I know you on the, the call here could relate to this, but it's about working really hard, really owning your ability, outsourcing what you can't do. In that effort turns into accomplishment. So it's finding the resources, the tools, the skills that your team might not necessarily have. And that reinforces number one through six about the process, trying, th trying new things, testing your limits, anticipating what's next, going first and, and taking on that new type of yeah. risk. It's really working yeah. hard and embracing new things. And I love what Alan said that what he's seen innovation work really well, the organization really reframes that it's not about failing, but about learning. And I think that's such a great way of putting it, that we're learning potentially what doesn't work. We're learning how we might do something differently. Um, and reframing is a huge, has a huge association with growth mindset because anything can be reframed based on how we look at it. So it's really our perspective of how we're viewing that perceived failure, that perceived growth opportunity. So since all of you read the book, we're gonna go through this section pretty quickly. These are the main themes of the book from Girl Stop Apologizing. So one of the themes was really around excuses to let go of. So we definitely can see this from a professional lens as well, but from her personal lens, she was saying that, you know, it could be that you feel like you don't have time, that you can't pursue the dreams that you have and maybe still be a good partner, a good spouse, a good employee. Um, it's already been done before. So I think it's been done before is interesting because we see that a lot from a pro professional context too, where um, that can often help prohibit us from seeing that there might be an additional opportunity there that we could serve a non-met need or a new audience, or there might be a different way of doing something similar to I would say most of us probably feel like subscription is a pretty mature trend, but there was still a different take on it that Panera was able to find. Another um, huge part of the book was around behaviors to adopt. Um, so this really idea of really embracing ambition, stop asking for permission to do something. And on the flip side, asking for help when you need it. So that might be like looking for expertise or, um, you know, she's a big fan, as I mentioned, of sort of like finding your own way by researching what type of help you would actually need and building those foundations for success. Um, and then also a huge part of the book is uh, being able to say maybe no to things that aren't serving you in that moment. And then the last part of the book was all around skills to acquire. So around how do you actually plan your goals, which is an interesting sub trend I'll talk about quickly as we're seeing this sort of like planner explosion right now. So we'll turn on the camera in a second and we'll show you some of the planners that we have here that we're going to give away. But also I can tell you pretty much every thought leader and influencer right now has a planner. And usually what they do is they sell them to their audiences with this framework for like how you're going to tackle this planner, how it's going to help you with your goals. And it, I just think it's interesting that, you know, in a digital society that we have so many consumers interested in these paper products. And so I think it speaks to this kind of this, this need and desire to sort of um, have this roadmap and have this plan for how you're going to accomplish things in your life and sort of feeling overwhelmed by a lot of digital tools. So it has just been interesting to see the evolution of that industry again. So we're going to go a little faster in this section just because we want to make sure that we can get through all of these areas. So in terms of the themes from the book that we saw, we saw redefining um, what it means. So this could also be in your role, like redefining how you see yourself in the roles that you may have in your life. And one thing that we thought in terms of an innovation opportunity here is that is there an opportunity to understand segments based on aspirations and motivations versus life stage? So M.M. LaFleur, I think is an interesting example of it. They do sort of this aspirational way of dressing yourself for work. And really like, we you know, if you want to own a room or you want to do a great job at your presentation or you want to feel your best. So sort of highlighting the aspirational impact behind what you're doing versus basing it on life stage or a pain point or something you're trying to cover up. So a very kind of more positive <coughs> aspirational way of looking at that. We also see this theme in terms of, and I think Alan just hit on this, but embracing failure as part of success. Um, so really realizing that failure is the price of admission. One thing that I'll mention here is we actually, um, we actually have been to the Dyson store and they show how many prototypes of the hairdryer it took for them to get the right one. And it was just interesting that they actually made sort of that, that process of learning and exploring part of their greater story behind why now they actually sell more hair dryers than they do vacuums and other types of appliances, which I think is a fun fact um, because that's such an interesting category for them to go into. And so an innovation opportunity here is, is there an opportunity to fail forward in innovation and invite consumers into the process? So thinking of ways that we can go into new categories and think about how, what we're doing differently and, and really embracing failure as part of that process to su success. 
So in terms of self-education being an asset, it's definitely a theme we've talked here. We had some great dialogue in the box around college and academic institutions changing in terms of this trend. I think someone mentioned that someone they know is now getting um, certified as a personal trainer through a college course, which is really interesting. And the innovation opportunity we have here is, is there an opportunity to help consumers self-educate or provide education as part of the product process? Um, so we have an example here of the wing, which is a woman's co-working space. So think of a WeWork, but really geared towards women's programming. And some of the things that they do is they actually help educate um, women entrepreneurs. They have panels of people who have built successful companies, different kinds of conversations and dialogues around situations you might find yourself in. So I think it's interesting that we're seeing brands I and mean, these experiences kind of take on education as this pillar of content that they're going to give to their consumers. But I think it, it's, we continue to transition to the knowledge economy. That will be interesting to see. Habits as an investment. Um, so we're seeing that habits is another buzzword in this community right now. I'm sure some of you have probably read a lot of the books that have been bestsellers recently about, you know, a habit every single day can really add up over time. You saw that classic example of if you imagine eating a bag of peanut or a bag of M&M peanuts every day versus a bag of kale every day, how over a couple of years that would actually stack up and, you know, potentially either help your health or potentially derail from it. And so just thinking of habits as sort of this ultimate investment into, into who we are and how that's helping us show up as a person that we are. So we're seeing in terms of innovation, is there an opportunity to help consumers develop positive habits? I've seen so much messaging, especially from the startup space and direct to consumer brands around products that either help you with a positive lifestyle change you're trying to make. It could be a daily routine, like when you think of morning or afternoon. Hydration is one example I wanted to mention because I've seen a lot around helping consumers hydrate and get their daily hydration needs because they know that that's a positive habit a lot of consumers are looking for. And so there's products now that are supposed to help you kind of, they hydrate you more than the average, you know, beverage would, or they help you retain that hydration. Um, another theme was just around this kind of empowerment to say no, and this empowerment to really focus on what you want to do and intentionally what you're going to do. So is there an innovation opportunity here to celebrate this movement around protecting time and priorities? This Lumenkind brand is actually tattoos that you put on yourself to remind you about an intention you made, whether it's to um, maybe stop smoking or maybe to eat healthier, but it's something that you might put on your hands so that you remember it. Um, and this is kind of a fun product that we've seen at shows like South by Southwest before. Yeah, they had everyone a, loves it. They had a big debut last year in the, ex the health expo here at South by. The last thing was around committing to leadership. So being the, embracing the fact that no matter where you are in your life, whether it's partner, you're with your kids or you're at work, but really embracing this idea of leadership. And I think we've seen a lot of brands, um, especially I would say even with smaller brands, kind of embracing the sense of leadership and building a community out. We happen to be in Austin, which is all about community and pretty much everyone knows everyone in certain circles. And there's this idea about being a community leader and collaborating in really fun ways with brands. So Cap Beauty is an example we have here. And they sort of are this indie beauty store in New York. And they've really embraced this idea of being a leader in that space. So being a leader when it comes to merchandising in new ways, when they're always kind of one of the first retailers to have these really experimental products that they believe in. So it might be from a brand that's super small that can't get distribution anywhere else. Um, and they have workshops and classes that really demonstrate their knowledge in that area. So when a consumer buys from their store, even if you don't live in New York and you can't go to that workshop, you feel like they really know what they're talking about, that if they have a new product, it's probably because it's awesome or you're going to go there and be able to uncover something that somebody else does not carry. So real quick, we are coming to the end here. So we're going to skip some slides, but someone had asked earlier if we are going to send out the deck and as always we are. And so you'll see some more examples packed in here of innovation opportunities and some really interesting learnings from the book. So we're going to skip to the conclusion here and make sure that I do have time for the giveaways. Uh, so that those of you who are still on can win these prizes. Um, so some considerations for you as you think about this. Fixed or growth mindset may shape consumer product preferences, acceptance of brand extensions, trust recovery following product failures, as well as the effectiveness of advertising and marketing campaigns. 
So definitely something to bring back to your team. People with a fixed mindset are more likely to seek products and brands in line with their goals to burnish their self image and demonstrate their positive qualities. While people with a growth mindset seek products that help them pursue their goals to improve and learn new things. So how can you play a role in people's personal growth? Products and brands may serve important self-enhancement functions, encouraging consumers to reinforce or expand core aspects of their identity. And finally, brands and companies can project a fixed or growth mindset. These mindsets should shape consumers' expectations of and relationships with products, brands, and companies. So that really summarizes how you should be considering fixed versus growth mindset in all of the work you do. So we're going to turn the camera right now and I'm going to do a giveaway. My team put a bunch I'll of names. Yeah. That. They put a bunch of names in a hat and picked them out. Um, if you were on any of our webinars from way back in the day, we used to do this ourselves real time. Um, but now there's too many of you on. So we have some support and I have been given six names. We said we would do three giveaways, but then I was notified that we actually had more. So we're going to give two of these away. Caitlin, do you want to talk about this market here? Like what, where these products come from? So this was kind of funny because someone from our team ordered this saying that they ordered the Start Today Journal by Rachel Hollis. And I was like, I got these. I'm like, these are not the Start Today Which Journal. Like, what is this? Um, but what was funny is that it's actually a fan made these based on Rachel Hollis's teaching in a book. And Rachel actually called that out on her conference that a lot of uh, people that are obsessed with her brand actually go on to make their own products and sell them for her conferences. So um, all of her learnings are sort of distilled into how you should think about your schedule and your goals. Um, so this is really fun. You could also give it to someone in your life that is a goal or goal oriented person or likes to use planners. So we'll give away two of the red ones first. Okay. So let's hold up that red one. All right. Gina Z. Gina Z, you are our first winner. We are going to be sending you this red planner. The second person to get a red planner is Pamela H. Pamela H, you are the second lucky winner. Now we're going to give away two of these purple ones. So these are journals. Um, so they have like daily habits, your intention, and 10 things you're grateful for each day. And the first winner is Erica P. Yay! You get a journal. Nice. Let's see how that works. Awesome. And the second purple journal goes to Becky B. Becky, so nice awesome. to have you on. We are going to send you a purple journal. All right. Next up is going to be the winner of this fine made for more hat. And I can assure you, you will have a nice time wearing this in the sun. You will feel very good about yourself. Victor H. We are sending you this. Victor H. Thank you for joining us. You get the hat. And this is actually sold. We forgot to mention this with the time. In the pop-up shop. Um, Rachel Hall had her own pop-up shop with like all of this motivational stuff from stickers to journals to water bottles, but everything that goes along with her brand because part of her brand personality now is to be very healthy, be hydrated, be high energy, have all this like journals and self-reflection time. So I think it's pretty cool that she's built that into a product-based business. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then finally, from Hollis Co., her actual um, start today planner, Liz W. Liz W., we're sending yeah. you this planner. Awesome. Get your goals started. And you can see this prints like a little more descript, like you don't, or in the script, like you don't know exactly what it is. And I think some of that's intentional to have something that um, is a little more private. Um, so that's, and you'll get to see what her practice looks like each day. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, it was wonderful having you on. We're very appreciative. We love when you join our book club. Please send us um, any messages, any feedback, and as always, you're invited to our next book club, which will be next quarter, and we'll be announcing that book and that topic very soon. Awesome. And for those of you that are newer to EBCO or you're interested in staying on and listening to us talk more, we're going to do a brief intro to EBCO and some of the things that we do. Um, so it serves as a nice introduction. But of course, if you're very familiar with us or um, you're you just to talked to us this week <laughs> <laughs> or you're getting out early for a Friday, then um, please, it was nice having you here and we'll be sending out the deck to you afterwards. So um, one, of the, um, one of the things that we wanted to mention is some of the things that we do at EBCO is we work at different stages of the innovation process. So we work with clients that are thinking of pre-strategy. So this might be looking at the very front end of where do we even think about, where do we need to think about going? What do we not know that we should know? Um, so these can be those larger forces that are really changing the way that consumers interact with categories and brands. Um, so a lot of times at this stage, people say, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Like it's very much growth mindset actually, um, with this, this idea that we can't possibly know everything we need to know because the world is constantly changing and evolving. Yeah. And typically the teams that we work with are 
inundated, and you can ref you can uh, appreciate this, inundated in initiatives and tasks and things that come down from senior, senior leadership or initiatives that you've self-started that are very focused in the category that you're working on. Um, you're dealing with competition, you're dealing with ROI. So to really focus on that pre-strategy of we don't know what we don't know, but we want to be made aware, usually needs to be sent out to another team with some sort of outside perspective that can help identify what that new big, that next big opportunity is, the trends that might impact your industry in a big way, trends that are coming from analogous and adjacent spaces that are going to start to impact your industry. And we can look at it through a lens that oftentimes to just get away and be able to deep dive like that isn't a possibility for the team. Yeah, great. And then the next one is front end. So typically this is already an identified platform. So if like wellness is a platform or sustainability is a platform, we can go deeper into those larger themes and see where there's going to be opportunities for the business to be successful. And so that can be great because it can provide additional clarity on where to go. It can provide insight into really distilling a trend down into things that are very actionable. That's going to actually help you make decisions on it. Um, deep dive category analysis. So this might be more specific to in, um, anything from a certain format. It could be like specific to beverages. So something where maybe a pipeline is more near term for you or you're in a highly competitive category and it's really finding differentiation in that space. Um, all the way on to the scouting. So this is where we help clients identify potential partners and opportunities for them. Um, this all comes from our trend work though. So we're looking for companies that align because they're, you know, maybe first players in there. So they're first to market. It could be that they're doing something with a lot of expertise that it would just be much faster to acquire them. Yeah. And or sometimes we'll see with some of our larger CPG clients, for instance, a growth strategy for innovation teams often is to acquire a technology or a brand that exists because they already see traction in the market. There's already consumers who really like that product. And so scouting in that way and using that as an avenue for growth becomes much more viable than trying to develop a competitive brand on your own. Uh, great, so that could even be if you have a business development function or a function where you're doing scouting work. And then finally go to market. So this would be if there's already a specific maybe technology that you have, maybe you have an AI diagnostic device and you really wanna know trends around what industries would that fit into, and maybe within a certain context of a space, how are we going to position this and talk about it? How does it align with what consumers think about their skin and what they want to do with it? And so that's much more targeted, as you can see. Um, but it's great because it usually is something that you're planning to do in a relatively short span of time. Yeah, and to understand how we how we go about this, we have specific specific programs. So our trend expeditions, which we absolutely love, we've been um, all over the globe doing these. Our team actually takes your team or a larger team, anywhere we've done it from very intimate ones where we have about three or four people from a small team to upwards of 80 to 100 people on rotation, where we go into market and immerse ourselves in the trend. So all of the upfront trend work and then going into market and immersing ourselves in it, having sensorial and experiential moments where we're feeling and learning and touching and experiencing what the trends are coming to life. And this is so brilliant for teams, for instance, that might be in a CPG space to then go see how is this represented in new retail models, for instance, or what do new flavors and formats look like, or what types of stories are being pulled on packaging. And typically this will culminate in an actual real-time in-field ideation session. So you can go in the span of two days, have a team fully immersed in the experience of these trends with all of this knowledge, all of those aha moments and verbatims and pictures captured, and then driven into an ideation session that then you leave with upwards of 100 ideas all in a two-day two time span. So mm -hmm. it's just a really good way to inspire teams in a very real-time way. Then we do our trend investigations, which is our core programming, and that is core to our expertise. We have expert strategists who use our proprietary fractal thinking process of looking at fractals and signals out in the market and really pulling them together to see where that momentum is, where there's movement in an industry, where we see growth, and painting that picture in terms of platform opportunities for teams to go towards innovation or growth opportunities, fill their pipeline in the next one year, or understand what's going to change their industry in the next 10 years. So that's really our core expertise that drives all of our other programs. Then we also have our trend immersion workshops where we bring the trends to life. So following those trend investigations or following an expedition, we can bring products, 
different types of materials. Um, we can bring segments and consumers to life, they in the journey maps, things like that for teams to come together to really understand the trends. And this works brilliantly for design, uh, design teams, R&D teams, innovation teams who are looking for concepts, but it works just as well to immerse marketing and sales teams, R&D teams, communication teams, uh, insight teams, to understand the trends for all of their own functions. We've even had senior, a lot of senior leadership come through our trend immersion so that they can be up to date on the things that are happening out in the market. Innovation pipeline that piggybacks on some of the things I've already been describing, and then scouting investigations, of course, to identify new technologies, new startups, new capabilities that exist out in the market that might be a viable solution for you in terms of growth opportunities. Yeah, and all of our programs are really centered on being very actionable. So that's one of the core tenets of EBCO is that we don't want research to just sort of live at this superfluous layer where no one knows what to do with it or it requires a lot of additional analysis to do something or strategic thought. It's really that we really think ourselves more as partners um, and really customizing the work to a point where we're almost like members of the team and um, we're helping the company prioritize their decision making, giving them something that's very leverageable and proprietary internally. Yeah, so if you have any questions about any of these programs, they're all custom. We become a partner to your team. Every single one requires a discussion and, and outlining specifically what your objectives are, thinking strategically about how to get to those end results so that you can take action on the information. Um, it's our worst nightmare, literally, like Kaylin said, to just turn over information and then your team's sitting there wondering what to do with it. So really that consultative element to the work um, is very important. As you can tell, we're, we're deep thinkers. We're really passionate about the work we do. So if there's anything that is on the docket for 2020, we'd love to discuss it with you. Um, and then of course, please stay tuned for more information on our Q2 webinar. Um, we have a thought leadership webinar coming up as well as a book club webinar coming up and we'd love to have you. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining us. We hope you have a great weekend and a great rest of your Friday.